Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 6th of August. And this quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 9th of August with me, Michael Hewson. Um, before we get started on that, we obviously have the small matter of today's US jobs report, which I think has been dominating uh, most of the um, news flow um, this week um, <coughs> across the financial press. But also, I think there's, 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 a, wider, there's a wider story um, playing out at the moment with respect to events in Asia and more specifically in of rising infection rates across Ch across China, um, causing anxiety that the rebound story in that part of the world is about to become the weakest link in the global recovery story. We're also um, we're also seeing um, an acceleration of cases across Indonesia, Thailand as the virus hunts out the parts of the global economy with low vaccination rates and obviously we've also got uh, rising infection rates in Australia as well which are prompting um, new lockdowns in places like Melbourne rising infection rates in Sydney so um, there is a concern I think that um, rising infection rates in unvaccinated parts of the world could create a little bit of a an economic recovery split or divergence, if you like. That hasn't really affected markets here in Europe or the US. Um, and nonetheless, if you look at, say, for example, the Nikkei 225 um, over the course of the past few weeks, there has been there has been evidence that the the gains there have really been struggling. I mean, since those since those since those peaks in February. We haven't really gone anywhere. I mean, we've traded sideways, albeit in a fairly broad range with the bottom of that range in and around these sorts of lows uh, in July that we saw at around about the 27,000 area. Um, what's notable, I think, or what's more worrying, I think, more broadly, is the fact that every subsequent rebound has been a little bit shallower than the previous one. So obviously that is a concern going forward. and it's something that I think we do need to keep an eye on. Nonetheless, if we look elsewhere, um, we've seen fairly decent gains across the board this week. We've seen um, record highs in the stock 600. We've seen this record highs in the FTSE 250, the NASDAQ, um, and the S&P 500 could well put in a new record high uh, later today. It's trading in and around that level right now. Um, ahead of today's jobs report. Um, so I think before we look ahead to the events of the upcoming week, which is, which is I think, fairly, fairly light in terms of um, macro announcements, we've got China trade numbers at the weekend, and we've got US CPI, and we've got UK second quarter GDP. Um, more broadly, I think, we need to talk about the jobs report because there's been an awful lot of column inches um, set aside for today's number. But ultimately, I think for me is really, is it likely to clear up the picture for the Federal Reserve when it comes to the timing or otherwise of a taper and or a rate rise? Um, there's been plenty of speculation about the importance of today's jobs report in terms of the timing of asset timing of a tapering of asset purchases and whether or not we get a rate hike in 2023 or late 2022. I think the reality is whatever today's number is, the picture is unlikely to be any clearer after the numbers drop than it is now, which means this month's Jackson Hole Symposium probably won't offer investors any steer on monetary policy or, or any significantly new steer than they currently already have. Now, why do I say that? Well, because when we look back at the June jobs report, the headline number was certainly a very decent improvement on the main number, 850,000 new jobs up from 583. The unemployment rate, however, edged higher, while the underemployment rate came down. Um, all the while the participation rate remained unchanged at 61.6. So despite all the narrative of the various Fed members, Richard Clarida, the 
um, Deputy Vice Chair, well, sorry, the Vice Chair, um, Christopher Waller, Permanent Board Governor, um, Neil Kashkari, um, New York Fed President John Williams, for example, is one member concerned about the lacklustre participation rate, given where it was pre-pandemic at 63.4%, and it's expected to rise later today to 61.8%. You know, what does it tell us? Today's July report comes against the backdrop of elevated prices, weekly jobless claims that appear to have found a base in around 400,000. This week's ADP report was very, you know, it was a lot weaker than expected, falling back to three, 330,000. So on the flip side of that, we had both ISM reports showing some decent gains in the employment components. So, you know, and the median number of consensus ranges from 350,000 for, today, for today's job, jobs report to 1.6 million. We'll pick the bones out of that. You know, what, what, what happens with respect to that? I think as we look ahead, I think we'll get a much better, clearer idea post-September when schools go back and all the unemployment benefits roll off then what you'll find is an awful lot of people who have been claiming unemployment benefit or various benefits as a result of the last stimulus plan will be forced to go back to work. And that's where we'll get a better idea of where the US labor market is right now. For the here and now, equity markets continue to push higher. And all the while, we still have US 10-year treasuries um, heading back towards the lows that we saw from early July. So if we look at this chart here, which is the chart of the US 10-year yield, we've managed to find a fairly decent area of support in and around 112, 113. Those were the those were the highs of those were the lows of earlier this week. So we're getting a bit of a rebound. I think there is an expectation and there is certainly this pressure being brought to bear on central banks to start to pare back some of their monetary stimulus. We saw that earlier this week with the Bank of England, who suggested that higher inflationary pressures might cause them to pare back their monetary stimulus and potentially even um, push, start to push rates up towards the end of next year and the beginning of 2023. So that's had an upward, that, that, I think that has helped to put a floor under yields. Whether or not that is sustained is anyone's guess. Certainly we're getting a bit of a rebound in US 10-year yields. Whether or not that is sustained after today's US non-farm payrolls is another matter, but I think we'd need to get back above 1.3% to really um, undermine the downtrend that's pretty much been in place since early March. Um, we've got US CPI coming out on the 11th of August and in the June numbers, the temperature in the US economy went up quite a bit. You know, my headline was feeling hot, 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 when we saw headline inflation rise to 5.4% on the headline CPI number, with core prices rising to 4.5%, which was the highest level since 1991. Now, yes, a large part of the US CPI number increase was driven by another 10.5% rise in used car prices and a one and a half percentage points increase in energy prices, while food and rent inflation also rose more than expected. The big question is how much of this is transient or transitory or whatever you want to call it, and how much of it is persistent. At the end of the day, we're probably not going to know um, for at least another two or three months. Certainly if June's number of 5.4% of doesn't mark the high watermark, then Fed officials may start to shift a little bit more uncomfortably as we head into the autumn. Certainly, if PPI numbers have been any guide, they also saw an increase in June, which suggests that CPI is probably going to head a little bit higher as well. And I think that really is the big conundrum that's facing an awful lot of, you know, an awful lot of investors. How far will the Federal Reserve allow inflation to rip higher? before they start to get a little bit anxious about the overall direction of travel of prices in general. 
you know if, if we look at what ppi ppi um final demand came in at 7.3 percent in june which was nearly two percentage points above us cpi and that was up from the previous month now there is an expectation in the cpi numbers for july that they could soften a touch certainly the pce core deflator did that um, in the most recent numbers so there is some evidence as well as the recent prices paid numbers out of the isms that inflationary pressure is starting to modestly level off that's certainly not borne out by the uh, behavior in the dollar index this week which saw big declines at the end of july before rebounding modestly at the beginning of this week nonetheless I'm still of the opinion that the dollar is likely to gain ground on the basis of the fact that ultimately the Federal Reserve is still more likely to tighten monetary policy or taper asset purchases than, than, than is the ECB, the European Central Bank. And we've seen that borne out this week um, by virtue of the fact the euro dollar has drifted back below 118 and a half and could well head back towards 117 and a half over the course of the next few days and weeks certainly the dollar does appear to be giving the impression that it may say may have um, bottomed out but you could also argue that this has the potential to be a little bit of a, a head and shoulders reversal on the cmc dollar index chart that we've got here so what am i going to do here i'm going to draw a little line in through here and keep an eye on not only these lows that we saw at the end of July, around about 957, uh, but also this trend line through here. If this is in fact starting to build up to be a potential reversal on the head and shoulders. But at the moment, while we remain above this trend line here, we remain very much in buy the dips when it comes to the US dollar. Um, I talked about Euro dollar and the fact that we broke below 118 and a half. Um, earlier this week, we now appear to be heading back towards these lows around about 117.60. You know, given the direction of travel with respect to European ECB monetary policy, for me, the line of least resistance is for a weak euro. We're seeing that playing out in terms of the euro against the dollar. We're also seeing it play out in the euro against the pound um, in the wake of yesterday's unexpectedly slightly hawkish tilt by the Bank of England. We can see that here in Euro Sterling. Um, the likelihood is that now that we've we've finally got below 85, we're probably going to head back towards not only this April low here of 84.70, but more importantly, um, head back towards the lows that we saw in early 2020, February 2020 of around about 83. Um, there or there, thereabouts. Euro sterling still for me remains very much a sell the rally type of trade, which brings us on to the pound. We've broken to the upside on the CMC sterling index, which suggests that we have potential for now further upside and retest the highs that we saw in February. Now, with that in mind, we've got UK second quarter GDP due out on the 12th of August. Having seen the UK economy contract by 1.6% in the first quarter. That was a much shallower contraction that was originally being priced in at the start of the year. If I cast your mind back to then, and the Bank of England was penciling in a minus 4% contraction, so minus 1.6 is, is, is a pretty significant um, improvement. Um, in the months after March, we've seen strong PMIs of over 60 across the board manufacturing construction and services for all of q2 retail sales growth has also been decent helped by falling unemployment as businesses reopen rising prices have been a headwind although the the comparatives from last year um, need to be taken into account um, so yeah when we look at the comparatives obviously the q2 lockdown a year ago saw the uk economy contract by minus 19.8 so you're going to certainly see a little bit of a whiplash effect when the annualised Q2 numbers for the UK economy uh, come out um, next, next week on the 12th. 
you, know, you should see a significant uh, rebound, preliminary rebound of 22.1% year on year, 4.8% on a quarterly basis is what is being predicted for quarterly GDP for the UK in the numbers next week, which is not too shabby and certainly 22.1% annualised needs to be set in the context of the 19.8% contraction that we saw in the numbers a year ago. So um, certainly in terms of the pound, particularly against the dollar, I'm still very much of the opinion that we can head higher. Obviously, the stronger dollar may act as a little bit of a drag on the pound, but a, a weaker euro sterling should help to support the pound to a certain extent. Fairly decent support in and around 138. That's this series of lows through here. We can just change that to a four hour chart and that, um, that illustrates the support level slightly better. I'll just draw that in through there. So you've got that 138, 60, 70 level there. And, but you've also got a fairly decent area of support in and around 138 and also these big, big lows around about 135.70. So um, overall, feels like it wants to head back towards, towards the highs that we saw in June, 142. Be aware that 140 is likely to be a very, very big obstacle. So you could see a little bit of selling interest in anywhere between 140 and 140.20. If 140.30 gets traded, then we could well see a move back towards the highs at 142.40. So that's certainly worth keeping an eye on going forward. Um, so that's euro dollar, euro sterling, sterling dollar. I'm um, looking at Brent crude prices. We're starting to see a little bit of a softening there. Um, concerns about demand out of China. Last three days of gains, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We've had a little bit of a rebound Thursday. Um, but nonetheless, we still remain very much in an uptrend here. So it'll be really dependent on whether or not we can break this little trend line here on Brent crude as to whether or not um, we've actually seen the highs. I'm still of the opinion that 80 is going to be a cute, very, very tough nut to crack. And if you've got concerns about slightly weaker demand at a time when OPEC plus are slowly increasing production, I think the offset to there is likely to mean that eighty dollars should be, so should be, I mean into an interim top um, for the near term. Looking at gold very briefly, it's a similar sort of story here. Um, continues to be um, undermined by slightly higher yields. The rebound in US 10-year yield has seen gold prices drift back, but again, we still remain very much in an uptrend from the lows that we saw in March. So pay particular attention to the lows of around about 1780, 1790 in this trend line support here. Um, the only way that I could see gold trending quite a bit lower from here is if US Treasury yields start to head back above 1.3% towards 1.4, and we could then see this roll over. So very much, uh, very much, very much um, a yield play. There. In terms of earnings this week, before we move on to that, let's quickly look at um, the various equity markets. Earlier this week, we had Goldman Sachs come out and revise upwards their end of year target for the S&P 500, 4,700. 4,900 by the end of 2022. Well, when we look at a chart like this, it's not hard to see why they've come to that conclusion. Ultimately, they're playing the Tina trade. There is no alternative. So <clears throat> for me, it's really about just following the trend that's sitting right in front of you, that's being displayed right in front of you. So for me, it's really about any dips, buy the dips, buy the dips, buy the dips. Look at the way that these, these dips have been bought. Look at this here. Down move, down move here, down move, down move here. Quick reversal, quick reversal, quick reversal. It's rinse and repeat pretty much. Um, a sustained move below the 50-day moving average could well undermine that narrative, but for the time being, it remains very much by the dip um, on the S&P 500. If we look at the NASDAQ 100, it's a similar sort of story. 
drawn in this this one here this is a daily chart and once again um, we've hit new record highs earlier this week FTSE 100 uh, bane of my life just does not want to go up even though the FTSE 250 continues to make record highs we could well be on course to see a new record high in the DAX before too long um, again you can see the narrative here is pretty similar um, strong sell-offs followed by strong rebounds the clear line in the sand is delineated here by for me this blue line that I've drawn in there so keep keep an eye keep an eye on that if we get back anywhere close to that as far as the FTSE 100 is concerned um, I think as long as we hold above 7,000 then we should should head back towards those peaks that we saw in June we still remain some way short of the all-time highs that we saw pre-pandemic um, doesn't mean that we're not going to get them certainly the numbers that we've seen from UK companies this week have been fairly decent unfortunately the FTSE 100 has a high proportion of cyclical stocks and in particular um, travel and leisure stocks which are likely to act as a little bit of a drag until such times as we get some evidence of a rebound in global travel and that is likely to remain subject to significant restrictions I think pretty much until um, early next year so I think the prospect of a rebound in the FTSE 100 needs to be tempered against that backdrop it's unlikely that we're going to get strong rebounds in the likes of IAG um, International Consolidated Airlines, Intercontinental Hotels Group, um, Travel and Leisure, EasyJet, um, TUI, that sort of thing um, until such times um, as we get a clearer idea of where things are but certainly in terms of the overall direction of travel there's really strong support at around 6,800 um, and also fairly decent support at around about 7,000 um, so still very much remains a case of buying the dip on the FTSE 100. In terms of some earnings announcements this week we've got on to Intercontinental Hotels I mentioned them just now first half earnings the ones I'm particularly interested in Deliveroo that's very much a lockdown stock if you like but it has actually been doing fairly well despite a pretty disastrous start when it IPO'd back in March um, at 390p listing price we've seen a slow recovery back from the April lows we're still below the listing price but um, the business has seen a fairly decent rise in orders 88% rise in orders in Q2 um, the companies undoubtedly benefited from the slightly slower relaxation of the restrictions that we've seen over the summer obviously we're due to unlock in June we didn't we unlocked in July we've had a summer of sport including Euro 2020 Domino's Pizza had their busiest ever day this year um, during the England Scotland game um, so you would expect that Deliveroo would have seen some fairly decent um, activity turnover over the course of Euro 2020 as well. Full year revenues are estimated to rise by 53% from 2020 levels of 1.2 billion. So I think um, to, to around about 1.8 billion. So, so any sort of number close to a billion pounds for first half earnings, first half revenues, is likely to be well received, looking for around about 900,000, 900, 900 million, uh, 1 billion pounds for first half revenues um, so that's Deliveroo you know can, can we get back above these highs of around about 340 um, hopefully the um, for hopefully for Deliveroo shareholders that will be very much positive um, let's talk about Cineworld and AMC um, two cinema chains who've had very divergent fortunes over the course of the past few months notwithstanding the fact that they're both equally as in difficulty as each other the difference that Cineworld has is it doesn't have um, the reddit crew watching its back so I think the big question for Cineworld is and we've seen that I think even though restrictions have been 
relaxed, there doesn't appear to be any respite for the share price. And I think the reason for that is that while revenues are likely to improve, Cineworld's biggest problem is its debt pile. Um, and, you know, while, while we've seen a decent recovery um, in its revenues as um, the economy has reopened, and they've managed to restructure um, their finances to May 2024, its debt is still within touching distance of $8 billion. So expectations for 2021 revenues back in March were in the region of two and a half billion pound with a return above $4 billion, sorry, two and a half billion dollars with a return above $4 billion expected in 2022. Both of these targets Mm, yeah, um, I'm unsure about them, particularly given the fact that if cinema releases follow the Black Widow model, whereby they're streamed simultaneously, made available for streaming simultaneously, you could see footfall take quite a significant hit. The hope is, the hope is that a strong release slate in the second half of the year, including the new James Bond film, will help to get those revenues up. Certainly in terms of the AMC numbers. I just can't buy into this. I mean, the, the, the share prices bears no relation to where it was pre-pandemic. If I take this all the way back, AMC is at record highs, despite the fact that its finances are in worse state, in a, in a worse state than back in 2015. And the only reason it is where it is is because of, of the Reddit crew. I mean, basically, the, the, the share price is way too high. It's way out over its skis. And really shouldn't be anywhere near as high as that. But you know, since when evaluations mattered when it comes to um, some of these companies. So in terms of AMC, it's going to be a similar sort of outlook, albeit the fact that US cinemas have been doing quite a bit better than the ones here in the UK. We've also got Coinbase, and that's likely to. Um, it looks as if it could well have found a base no pun intended, um, in the short to medium term. Second quarter earnings, profits profits are expected to come in at $2.41. Bitcoin has settled down a bit in recent days. So the lack of the lack of significant movement in Bitcoin could well play a part in Coinbase's share price. What's interesting about this is how if we look at Coinbase over the course of the past few weeks. It's all pretty much traded sideways. The share price is bottoming out. And if we look at Bitcoin, it's pretty much done the same thing. They're almost mirror images of each other. So it'll be interesting to see if Bitcoin does break higher, whether Coinbase follows it. It'll be an interesting, it'll be an interesting one. That again, Coinbase is due on the 10th. Finishing up with Disney. This is a nice little chart here. Um, drawn, drawn a line through these lows here. Um, a lot of anticipation around these numbers. Obviously, the theme parks have reopened. Holidays have restarted. Disney Plus is doing very, very well. Um, there's a host of new content which may attract new users, including the addition of Loki, the new animated Star Wars series, The Bad Batch. And they've also added, um, for UK and Australian users, Star which is the Fox catalog of films like X-Men, Avatar, and what have you, as well as the addition of National Geographic. Um, also, you get 4K content um, without having to pay extra like you do for Netflix. So be interesting to see um, whether or not um, profits for Q3 match the improvement that we saw in Q2. So expectations there are for profits to come in around about 56 cents a share, which is slightly below the levels of 79 cents a share that we saw in the second quarter of this year. OK, so um, that's pretty much I think that's pretty much it for um, this week's week ahead. I'd like to thank you all very much for listening and um, I'll speak to you all same time same place next week and have a good weekend one and all.